Awesome. Well, my name is Mike. Uh, if you're used to the guy with hair and a nice beard, he is on his anniversary uh, vacay. He is away for this week. And so you have me. My name is Mike. I met Kevin several years ago. I was one of the pastors at Fuel Church, and we were on staff together. And uh, him and Kim are some of my favorite people. Wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm just grateful for what God is doing here at City Place. And so <clears throat> I want to get right into the message this morning uh, because we're in our series called All In. All In. Now, uh, Pastor Tim brought a message week before last, uh, launching the series. I'm going to do the second one, and Pastor Kevin will wrap it up next week. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk, we're going we're to push through today in a little bit different dynamic about being all in. We're actually going to get to maybe some of the deeper reaches behind what it means for you to go all in. Maybe behind the motivation for you to go all in. So let's do this. Let's uh, first of all take a look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts in the New Testament. In chapter 9. And this is the story this morning of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul uh, his, his, his conversion story, or how he came to know Christ. And this is what's so interesting about the guy we're getting ready to meet. His name was Saul to begin with. And Christ interacted with him on this road because he chose, Christ chose, to use him for the rest of his life. And what ended up happening was uh, he gave him a new name, Paul. Right? And Paul wrote most of the New Testament. So most of what you see after the book of Acts was written by Paul. So that was a, that's an amazing thing. So let's begin reading. Let's pick up with Acts chapter 9. And we'll begin reading at verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, that's like people who are Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3, now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone round about him. <clears throat> and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank anything. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight and the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus <clears throat> named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias said, <clears throat> Lord, I have, heard, uh, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from, your, from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Taking food, he was strengthened. So this is God's word. So 
let's pray and we'll get into the message. Dear God, we love you. <clears throat> and as we continue worship this morning, by way of inviting you to come and participate, you, you said where two or three are gathered, you will be there. So we love you and thank you that you're with us. And I pray that we would quiet our hearts before us and if we are challenged by some point in the message today, I pray that you help us to give way to the Holy Spirit and to give way to your powerful, mighty word so that life change and transformation may occur. You are worthy. You are to be honored. You are holy. And whenever we meet you, our lives will never be the same. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for coming for us and rescuing us. And we ask you that you would be with our words today. In your worthy name. Amen. So, I think I want to start really by asking one question at the beginning of my message this morning. And that question is what do you take seriously in your life? What do you take seriously? And the reason I ask that question is because of this. What you claim is serious owns you. What you say, hey, I'm serious about, do you know that determines what you spend your resources on? It determines how you live your life. It determines what you attend, where you go, who you marry, what you claim is serious. What are you all in on? Some of us are all in on exercise. That's not me. I'm not an exercise guy. Some of us are car people. Anybody car people in here? I bought a new car. I had a new car. And my wife gets in. I'm like, hey, can you take your shoes off? <laughs> new car. What about, uh, uh, think about some things in your life that you are all in on. What about your lawn? Do some people meticulously maintain their lawn? Or sometimes people decorate their house. So there are things that like, we are all in on. Foodies, some of us love to go to restaurants and I check out some Facebooks and I see people with different, you know, with your face and a plate of food, you know, and we see that you're eating at a certain restaurant. And so some are all in on education. But the reason I ask is because what you name as serious claims you. So don't just take a snapshot this morning. Don't just say, well, you know, I'm serious about this on the surface. No. What are your desires? What makes you happy? What makes you tick? What do you think about? What are your dreams about? And do these include your Savior, Christ? Do these include Christ? Are you serious about Christ? Are you serious about Him and His gospel? Or are you all in on your own plan? So out of this series of verses that I just read, three points today. I'm going to give them all three to you right now and we'll go through them. All in with your own plan is not a good plan. That's point number one. Point number two, all in with God's plan is your own plan. And point number three, why do we go all in? Why do we go all in? Ready? All right. <laughs> Let's look at this. All in with your own plan is not a good plan. When we see Saul, when we see what Saul was doing, the Bible says he was still breathing threatenings against the disciples of the Lord. So when I look at Saul, I look at him up against Scripture, and his life is like my life. The Scripture calls Saul dead. He calls Saul an enemy of God, Call Saul blind. You know the scripture says that about us apart from Christ? The scripture doesn't say I've got most of this stuff figured out and I just need a little Jesus to join in with my program so that I can make things okay. No, the scripture calls for radical transformation. The scripture says I am so radically broken that without Christ, I'm not morally neutral. I'm not neutral. 
The Bible says in Romans 1 that I suppress the truth of God. I push it away. I push it down. I don't want to know it. But yet God comes in and runs to me and rescues me. This is the story of humanity. This is my story. And this is your story. And it's funny for us to think about we can be dead and yet alive. We can be physically alive, the Bible says, but spiritually dead. We can uh, be breathing but have no discernment about God. The Bible teaches that no one is neutral. The Bible teaches no one has a disposition towards God. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says it this way. There is none righteous no, not one. Man, that's not how I like to think about myself. I like to think about myself as, hey, I, got, I pretty much got this figured out. I pretty much got this thing about going all in, about being a disciple, about pushing forward. I mean, I'm a type A, type a personality. I can do things, right? And I, I have some skills. And so in my mind, I think, no, that can't be. I can't, I can't be dead apart from Christ. I can't have a moral inability to follow Christ. But Jesus put it this way in John 6. He says, no man can come to the Father but by me. What does that mean? Well, when I went to school, like all of you, I went up to the teacher's desk and I said, can I use the bathroom? And she said, well, I'm sure you can use the bathroom. The question that you're asking is wrong. I believe the question is, may I use the bathroom? So when the Bible says no man can, no person can come, what they're saying is, apart from Christ, I can't do it. I don't have the ability to do it. I have a dead life. And so my plan, all in on my plan, is always going to lead to destruction. It's always going to lead to a bad plan. Why? Because I can't choose against my nature. That's not to say I'm always evil. That's not to say I always do the worst thing. But that says my natural inclination is to run away from God. My natural inclination is to run. And look at our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. Perfect garden. Perfect Savior in fellowship with Him. Perfect people. And they run off in the woods naked and alone and running from God. But God pursued them. And this is our story. And this is what's happening to Paul. The Bible calls us dead in Ephesians 2.1. He calls us enemies of God in Romans 5.8. The Bible calls us blind in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Man, that's an indictment on me. That assaults me. I don't like that. All in with your own plan is not a good plan. Why? we are so radically broken that apart from Christ we cannot make up the distance to a holy God. Number two, all in with God's plan is the only plan. You notice when Jesus on the road to Damascus met Saul who would later be the Apostle Paul. He didn't say, now, Saul, I want to make a deal with you. i got three doors here. Behind door number one is me. You can choose me. Or behind door number two, well, it's the enemy. You can choose him. Or behind door number three, it's just what you want. It's just what you want to do. You just choose those. No. When Christ came for Saul, Saul ended up on the ground in front of a holy righteous, sovereign king. So I want to ask you a question. Is your God a dangerous king? In the message promo, you know, we have this, we have this version in evangelicalism about a God who's kind of a hand-wringing, oh, I want you to allow me to join your program, and oh, I, do, I, I hope that you would come, and I just pray that you know we have a king who is a conquering warrior who sits on a throne, who's ruling and reigning now, now, all the kings of the earth will bow down to him. He is our sovereign Lord and King. And, and he's a dangerous king. See, uh, 
But not only is he dangerous, he's our best friend. He's our lover. He cares about us. He came for us. He will allow us to sit at his table and he blesses us even when I rail against him. I've said things this week that he, that he should have cast me away from his sight. I've lived this week in such a way, look at your life. A righteous, perfect, holy God, what would he have been just to do with you and I this week? To put us away and never look at us again. But he doesn't. He loves us. He's our faithful friend. So he's not allowing, he's not saying, please allow me to join our plan, his plan, or your plan. He said, I, I, I'm going to show you what my will is, what my plan is. A lot of times, we have a version of Christ that's this. We want to, in, we want to invite him into our stuff. And really, we don't even want Christ. We want a version of him that gives us everything we want. That's why you see TV preachers, a lot of them. What are they saying? Here's their message. You trust Christ, and you're going to get a new car. Or he's going to pay your house off. If you give him $1,000, he's going to give you whatever. God is not a vending machine. He's a, a real person. Christ is on a throne. He, he opens the door for us to have a relationship with him. And so it's a fundamental misunderstanding. That's not Christ. That's not Jesus. He's a mighty king. He's a conquering hero. He's glorious and on his throne. He's ruling and reigning. And he is dangerous. But he loves us and he's our greatest friend. There's a British writer and a lay theologian named C.S. Lewis. He had positions at Oxford and he had positions at Cambridge. And he wrote a series. Uh, and one of the series of books that he wrote is called The Lion, Witch, and Wardrobe. And these characters in this book are very interesting. There's Aslan, which is the king, which is a lion. And uh, then there's the white witch who deceives people. And then there's four kids, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. Now, Edmund is a lying, conniving, wicked person who betrays Aslan, who in the story is a type of Christ. And Aslan lays down his life and is killed for Edmund. And he rises again. And what happens is this. Uh, the kids go to a, a mansion and the professor that runs the mansion says, don't look around, but during a rainy night, a rainy day, they look around. And one of the girls opens up the room and there's nothing in it but a big wardrobe. And she opens the wardrobe and appears to be empty. She gets in it and when she turns around, all of a sudden, she's in a massive place called Narnia, right through a wardrobe. Now, those of you, maybe you don't know what a wardrobe is, it's a big place where you put all your clothes and all your shoes. Some of you need three wardrobes. <laughs> um, so anyway, Aslan lays down his life for Edmund. But he, and they meet some interesting characters, and if you've never heard of C.S. Lewis, it's on Netflix, you can watch it, um, or maybe Hulu or someone, I know I've seen it on one of the, one of the providers like that. So, they, they're, they're in this Narnia, and they meet somebody called Mr. Beaver, and you'll never guess what he is, but anyway, I'm going to read you just a little interaction that they had. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? Shall I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about being safe? Of course he is safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So our king that we serve is not a hand-wringing God who is begging us to allow him to come and join our program. He is a God who created the universe and spoke it into existence, who wants to be your friend, who wants to love you, and who wants to allow you to enter into a relationship with him that will transform your life. He changes everything. 
He changes everything. The message promo uses the word dangerous. He wants us to be dangerous. We are dangerous only to the degree that we rest in Him. Only to the degree that He is the source of our life. Only to the degree that we recognize He's the sovereign king and that His plan is best. Will you serve a true and living king? Will you serve a true God? Or have you and I made gods in our own image that we can kind of boss around? The God I serve, He says things I don't like. Like in, like in Acts 9. Paul's breathing threatenings against Saul is against the church. One minute later, he's on his face before a holy God. I don't like that. That happened. But my God is bigger than me. He's bigger than me. So all in with your own plan is not a good plan. All in with God's plan is the only plan. He is sovereign. We are made for worship of Him. And lastly, why do we go all in? Why do we go all in? You know, I've been around Christianity a long time. Thirty some odd years I've been a state. I look 70, I know, but I'm 58. So. But I've been around this thing a long time. And can I tell you the difference I see in people? I see two types of Christians. Like I see some Christians who are who, who join with Christ and they stay with Him. Not not perfectly. It's about direction. It's not about perfection. But then I see another group who join with Christ and say, you know, this is not what I signed up for. And they be when the pain comes or when cancer comes. So what I need to do when heartache comes or trouble comes or pain comes, I need to recognize that God is there with me in my pain. He's not, he's not saying he'll deliver me from all my heartache. He's not saying he'll, he'll take me away from everything. And notice what he said to Saul. He said, go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles, for I will show him how much he must suffer. See, that's not, that's not what I signed up for when I became a Christian as a teenager. I didn't sign up for the suffering part. I signed up for the new car part. I signed up for God giving me my house and what I wanted. And what I realized is, wait a minute. I still get sued. My friends still die of cancer. I still have trauma and tragedy in my life. And this old, this world assaults me. But Christ is there with me. And he loves me. He's my friend. He would never turn loose of me. Never let me go. And only do things for my benefit, even when I don't understand. Some people follow along, and some people leave. But the difference is in the perspective, what they think about God. Is their problems bigger than their God, or is God bigger than their problems? The people who leave, their problems are bigger than God. The people who stay, they don't lose focus that God is bigger than anything they could ever go through. And He loves them. And one of the things that we must know about our God is the Bible says that He is such a righteous and gracious King that He works all of our junk, even our bad decisions. He works it out for His honor and His glory and for my good. Man, I can trust a God like that. I can rest in a God like that. So then it's not all up to me. And when I blow it, which I will, probably before I get out of here today, God still loves me. I'm still one of his own. So doesn't that take the pressure off of me? Yes, it does. The other thing that Christ does, he's so gracious that everything he commands, he gives me. He gives me. If he commands me to repent, he grants repentance. If he commands me to follow, he allows me to follow. So that ultimately, while it's not perfect, and while it's two steps forward and, and three steps back, I will follow him. I will follow him. Christ put it this way. He said, the thing that I've begun in you, 
I will not fail to perform it. That's a lot of him and not a lot of me, because I'll fail to perform it. I will let you down. I will let you down. But Christ will never let me down. Even when I can't see him, he is a sovereign and righteous king. And Jesus put it this way, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them. We will follow. So it takes the pressure off of me to live this life and go from Sunday to Sunday and, okay, what do I need to do now? And then, okay, I did that. What do I need to do now? And what do I need to do? No, Christ has done it all. He lived the life that I couldn't live so that I can rest in Him and stop the tap dance. And stop all the stuff I try and do. Stop all the buckets I try and live, live out of, like, religious activity and you know, a better version of me and, and all these things that I do so that I can stop. Jesus said it this way in Matthew. He said, if any would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, I didn't come for the cross. I want the crown. I didn't come for the cross part. I just checked in. I just want to kind of bypass and go right to the crown. I want to be the king for his gifts. But Christ said there's a cross. He said there is something for each of us to bear. Life is hard. And if you're not careful, the enemy will convince you that your God is not there or your God does not care. And these are lies. He is there. He does care. He is a very present help in time of trouble. But when he says take up your cross and follow me, what happens on the cross? Ah, people die. We follow Christ. We must follow Christ through the world of suffering. Everybody, teenagers, college, everybody. We will suffer. Don't be surprised. Don't think God has abandoned you. Don't say, well, this bad stuff happened to me. I must not be obeying God enough. You didn't surprise God like he knew we weren't going to obey him. That's why he came for us. That's why he came to die. That's why he lived the life that you and I couldn't live. So we carry all this baggage into the relationship with God, just like we carry the baggage into the relationship with our wives or with our significant other. And through wrong expectations or bad teaching or wrong ideas, we, we can have, we can have, we can say something within ourselves that we may never say to God. And it's this. You owe me. I served you. I gave to you. I gave that church down there. You owe me. I did what you said. I sing. I pray. I serve. You owe me. Look at all the things I've done. Give money. Why am I suffering? Why is all this bad stuff happening? I'll tell you why. Because it's the doorway for you to have fellowship with your God. So we hold that door. And when the door of suffering is there, God asks us to step up. Whether we lose a boyfriend or lose a girlfriend or we don't get into the college we want or the mate that we have is, is not what we had in mind or they die or we hold to that doorway of suffering and white knuckle it and we scrape all the way in like no I don't want to go through this door but it's the only way to fellowship it's the only way to truth free peace but yet that's not what we see on TV or that's not what we see when we see these preachers on these TV shows that are living in four million dollar houses right that's that's not gospel. That's anti-gospel. That's not a Christ. You don't enter to Christ through the million dollar house. You enter to Christ through suffering. And so don't be surprised when it happened. I, in preparing for this message, I did some, did some research and one of the things that I 
actually was, was looking at was, uh, I recognize that some of us in the Western culture may, may assault our, our views and values um, when we say that, that, that Saul was assaulted on the road. He was, he was hammered on the road by Christ. But I want to read something that I, that I, that I pulled up. It's actually in a Christian magazine. And it's entitled this, When Muslims Dream of Jesus. And it said a recent study recounted interviews with 750 former Muslims who had converted to evangelical Christianity. Many of the reasons they gave for their conversion would be expected the love of God, changing the Bible. But one of the reasons that they gave was because they were dreaming. And in their dreams, they experienced visions and they fit into the four following categories. Jesus speaking to scripture to them, even though they had never heard it. Jesus telling people to do something. A dream or vision that led to a feeling of being clean or peace. And a man physically wearing white appeared. So I, I want you to know that in the deepest, darkest night, that God is still doing these types of things that he did to Paul. He is still reaching for people. And the article goes on to say, a friend of mine tells of a Persian migrant who arrived at a refugee center at 6 a.m. He was very upset. He told his story to a, a Persian pastor. During the night, he saw someone dressed in white. And he raised his hands and said, Stand here, follow me. And the Persian man said, Who are you? And the man replied, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. No one can go to the Father except for me. He began to speak to the Persian pastor and asked, Who is he? And what should I do with this? Why is he asking me to follow him? And how should I do it? In response, the pastor held out his Bible and said, Have you ever seen this? And he said, No. He said, you don't know what it is. He said, no. And the pastor opened the book of Revelation and he read these words. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And the man started crying. He said, how can I accept him? How can I follow him? So the pastor led him to the place of Christ. Peace came over him. The pastor gave the man a Bible, and he said, you need to hide this Bible because muscles in the camp will cause you great problems. But the man replied, the Jesus that I met today is more powerful than the muscles in this camp. He left, and an hour later, he returned with ten more Persians and told the pastor, these people want what I have, and they want to buy them. So what I want to tell you I want to challenge us to look in the face of a sovereign king who is on a throne, who is effecting change in history. He's not a beggar asking him me to follow him. He's a conquering warrior who loves me and gave his life for me. And he is still working like this in the world today. I can trust a king like this. I can trust a God who loves me and gave himself. I can trust that even through the suffering that he is caring. And just like with the Apostle Paul, when I was an enemy of God, breathing threatened against God, and pushing his, his knowledge out of my mind, he came for me. And one day, after thousands of times of hearing the message of the gospel, which is that Christ lived the life I couldn't live. He died on a cross for me. He paid the debt for my sin. And if I will trust his sacrifice, there is a relationship waiting for me. And if I trust the sacrifice that he made, the death that he made for me, that I can join him and be on mission with him and be in a relationship with him and that he would love I, I know I've heard the gospel ten thousand times. But one day, when the preacher said, talking to the gospel, I said, 
that is called me. Did I just get smart one day? Did one, did one Thursday afternoon, all of a sudden, I just studied it enough? Oh, I did it? No. Christ came for me. He opened my eyes. And when the preacher said the gospel, I said, that's for me. I can trust God. I can trust Him. I can go all in. I can push my chips into the center of the table and say, that's it. I'm all in. I'm all in. Why? Because He loves me. And he gave himself for me. The band would make their way up and wrap up. I want to read a little excerpt, just a handful of lines from John Owen, a Puritan pastor, who wrote a book, and the book is called Communion with God. And in one of the chapters of the Communion with God, there's a little ending paragraph talking about fellowship with Christ. And I, I'd like for all of us to do this. I'm going to pray in a minute. Can we just stand before John leads us into a moment of some worship? And I just want us to bow our heads. And I want to read this last little paragraph. And I want you to do business with your God. He is here. He is real. He is standing in your face this morning. And I want you to listen to what I have to say about him. Look within yourself. Does Christ have a rightful place in your heart and life? Is he in your thoughts? Do you desire him more and more? Do you really count all things as loss in comparison to him? Or do we really prefer almost anything in the world who is the rightful king to take ownership in my life? May it be Jesus. Only Jesus. He is a king and a friend who has the right to command nothing less than that I go.